Welcome back to another Geek Out session with Real Science with Chris Neal. This session is all about the differences between HCG and clomiphene, kispeptin, and gonadarellin. Those are four very, very common uh, medications that are used during TRT. I hope you guys enjoy. If you like this content and would like to see more, please, please hit the like and subscribe button. It really means a lot. Thanks a lot. Stay healthy. All right, guys, this is our geek out session, and this is going to be a pretty complicated one, so let's jump right into it. HCG, gonadarellin, and clomiphene, kispeptin. I get asked about these all of the time in my clinic. Um, so how do they work? Why do you guys need them? What is it for? Do, you know, and, and, and which one is best? So when it really comes down to it, there's not a right or wrong answer to this. Um, everybody is very, very different, as you hear me talk about all the time. So I'm going to go into the science behind all of it. It is a little bit complicated. I'm going to try and put this up on the screen so you guys can see it a little better. But it's helpful to kind of follow the, the madness here because there's a lot going on. So the, um, the ones that I have in black, these are the medications that we're talking about. Kispeptin, and clomiphene, gonadarellin, and HCG. The thing is, if you are on TRT, then uh, medically managed TRT, then there's got to be something something not optimal about some part of that process. We don't actually, it's, sometimes it's difficult to determine which part of your cascade is having an issue. So depending on which one is having the issue, the one medication might work better than another. That's basically to, to sum everything all up. Um, but let's jump into it. So how, first, the first thing we do, as always, we have to dig in deep to uh, understanding the mechanics of the process in the first place, right? So where does it all start? It all starts right here, KN, the kispeptin neuron. This is up in the hypothalamus, deep inside the center of your brain. So at the kispeptin neuron, that's what's, what initiates the entire cascade, okay? So uh, of getting everything working to have testosterone produced and uh, to, to support your testicular function and all of this. So it starts with the kispeptin neuron, which makes kispeptin actually. So right in here, kispeptin is actually produced inside the body. Now, if this is where the problem is, step one, then supplementing with kispeptin right in here stimulates more of this activity from step one, right out, right out the gate. So I like kispeptin, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's very natural to use. How you use it, it has a rather short half-life, so you do need to take it more often. Some people can handle twice a week, but usually you have to do a little bit more than that. But you need to make sure that you work with your uh, make sure you you work with your medical professional so that they can provide the, uh, the the best direction for you with any of these medications. You don't want to mess around with them. You want to get the best direction. So if you don't have a place you can go to, obviously you can come see us at Vivo Health Solutions. We're more than happy to help take care of you. So anyway, back to this. So. The kispeptin neuron produces kispeptin and that stimulates the next part of the cascade. The, uh, the, the uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone neuron. So at, in this location, we're still inside the hypothalamus. In this location here, it gets stimulated, it gets turned on by kispeptin and this neuron here produces gonadotropin or, or a gonadotropin releasing hormone, GNRH. Okay, so very important. This is now, this is the first signal that's actually going to leave the hypothalamus. We're still deep in the brain and it doesn't have very far to go. It's just gonna go into the pituitary gland to kick off the next segment. So as it's traveling, you know, from, from hypothalamus to pituitary gland, you know, right in here, that's what this green line uh, signals. Now, if this is the problem that you have in your cascade, then gonadarellin really takes care of that because your gonadarellin is GNRH. It, that's what it is. So when you're injecting that, you're just boosting this signal that your gonadotropin releasing hormone neuron is supposed to be doing, okay? So we're gonna come back around to this in a second and figure out what this E is right here. Uh, but so that's, that's your gonadarellin. That's going into the pituitary gland. Inside the pituitary gland, deep in the brain, there is another section, another home called the gonadotroph cells, okay? So in the gonadotroph cells, they're waiting. They're sitting there waiting for a signal, which is the GNRH. Once they get that signal, then they produce something new. They produce LH, luteinizing hormone and, and follicular stimulating hormone. These are the two hormones that, and these are all, these, all of these so far that we've talked about are peptides, okay? These are all peptide hormones. So your LH and your FSH, that is actually going to travel out of the pituitary gland 
into the bloodstream all the way down to the testicles, okay? So we need a, a, a special mechanism for that. So that's your LH and FSH that travels all the way down to the testicles. And once they get into the testicles, it gets, it's very complicated. We don't need to go there. But what it does, it activates the, your testicular function. Now, um, as you guys have heard me say, the way the testicles are function, the, the way they function is that they don't care whether they're attached to your body or not. If they get the signal to keep the lights on in the factory, they keep the lights on in the factory. And then you get what the, test, what the factory produces. Here are some of the things that they do. They do produce testosterone, obviously. They do produce sperm. Not everybody needs that. Um, but they, they also have a lot to do with your sexual sensitivity, the amount of ejaculate that comes out, and your strength of orgasm. So that's the job of, of the testicular factory. So if you do not want to do have anything to do with any of this stuff, then you should expect that your factory will shut off. And when it does shut off, then they, the, your, your testicular factory does shrink. Okay, so your te you will notice some testicular atrophy typically. So, LH and FSH come down and stimulate the testicles. Let's say this is a part of your cascade that's having an issue. HCG, HCG is an analog, so which means it looks structurally very, very similar to your LH and FSH. So the way these hormones work, they activate the next step, kind of like a lock and key mechanism. So your HCG mechanically looks like a replacement key for your LH and FSH. It stimulates the factory and hey, we got lights on again. So that's how that part works. So that's that's your HCG. This one, this one uh, is um, has been around the longest out of all of these. One of the things about HCG though, is that um, there has been a lot of pressure from some of the big pharma companies to um, to no longer allow or to do whatever they can to, to block compounding pharmacies from for the production of HCG. So technically it's not banned in the United States. It's still around, but it's but they've really tried to wedge out the compounding pharmacies, unfortunately, um, more for money purposes than anything else, um, so that they can be the ones to produce it and not the compounding pharmacies. In truth, they make it exactly the same way. There's absolutely no difference between the brand name and the compounding pharmacy. There's zero health risks involved with it at all. So it's strictly a money thing and it's actually kind of sad. Um, but HCG will come back around. This is actually the third banning of HCG that I've been around or I've been through. So um, I think it'll come back around and we still have access to it. So that's that part. Now, what happens next? So the, the testicles do produce testosterone. This leaves the testicles and goes into the bloodstream, right? So, but it doesn't stop there. This is the, this right in this zone, once it's in the bloodstream, this is where if you happen to be one of those guys that do need to be on TRT, then this is where adding additional testosterone is gonna come into play. But we need to understand what mechanically happens next. You know, so, um, so once it's in testosterone, it doesn't just stay as testosterone. It's gonna split and it, it can do one of three things. It can either stay as testosterone, it can even, it can convert into something called DHT. We'll talk about that in some of my other videos. Dihydrotestosterone, it's a much more active form of testosterone that activates the androgen receptors. Or it can turn into estrogen. Estrogen and testosterone structurally are incredibly similar, but they could not be more opposite in their action and what they can do. So, very, very important here. So we need to understand that once testosterone is floating around your belt in your body, whether the testicles produce it or whether you're injecting it, some of that is gonna turn into estrogen. So we've talked about that before in some of our in some of my other videos. So this right here, I just kind of made a note here. This is where aromatase inhibitors come in. AIs is what we call it. Anastrozole, um, eximistane, letrozole. There's there's several. There's some herbal versions too. You know that that help to kind of block this mechanism here to slow down and prevent testosterone from converting into estrogen. Um, uh, having too much estrogen is a problem. Having too little estrogen is also a problem. So we got to be able to, that's, that's a very tricky balance right there. So again, work with your medical, uh, medical practitioner and, um, and hopefully they can guide you in the right direction with that. We do it all the time. So what happens with the estrogen? So everybody kind of has this belief that if you start taking testosterone, it's going to shut you off. So technically that's not true. If we dig into the mechanism, we have to understand that. Now the body is full of negative feedback receptors. So they do that, uh, the body is set up that way in order to protect itself from having too much of something because that's a problem. Now it only does that 
when it really believes that uh, it, it, it specifically is designed to protect you from specific hormones that cause a problem. And this is just an interesting fact here. So the testosterone by itself does not flip your switch to off. It doesn't. Testosterone converts into estrogen. Estrogen is the key that flips your switch to off. This E, this little, this little red part here, this is the section, this is the on and off switch. Okay, when there's too much estrogen in, uh, in your, floating around in your body, then the hypothalamus is looking, it's sensing, not testosterone, it's sensing estrogen. And once it gets that, once it gets too much of that signal of estrogen, it wants to limit the whole process because something ain't right. So it's going to switch it off. It's gonna switch off your, uh, your gonadotropin releasing hormone neuron, and then everything south of this shuts down. Okay, everything south of that shuts down. And that's what happens when you're on testosterone. Okay, um, or um, that's what, yes, that's what happens when you're on testosterone. So um, one of the newer medications, that are the newest medication really that's out, this one is a pill, all the others are injectable, but this one here, enclomiphene, is a pill. So enclomiphene goes in and it blocks that on and off switch. So estrogen isn't able to get in there and switch you off anymore. So that it, it allows the process to, to continue to go unencumbered. It allows the process to continue to flow and the, with a regular cascade, just like it normally would. Even while you're on testosterone, it prevents that block, you know, or it blocks that, uh, that, from, that from switching you off. So everything continues to run business as usual, which is what we want. That's the goal. So um, I really like enclomiphene. It's nice because it's a pill. Um, and, uh, and, and it just goes in, it does its one job. It has very, very few side effects, uh, if any, really, um, the, uh, to speak of. So the enclomiphene is, is very similar to clomiphene or clomid. Clomid had a lot of, had, had several side effects, really. Um, but the, what they were able to do, they were able to basically splice up the uh, clomiphene um, molecule or, or, or uh, structure and, um, and only save the, the active forms that are really important for this mechanism and cut out all the other stuff that has nothing to do with it that, ca that actually causes the side effects. So very, very clean pill. I really like it a lot, but it's important to understand that all of this stuff has to be balanced. If you wanna use enclomiphene, you have to make sure that the amount of enclomiphene you're taking is able to withstand the amount of estrogen that you've got coming through to block. Okay, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very three-dimensional or physical thing. If you're running minimal levels of enclomiphene and you you happen to be one of those that is either doesn't understand how to use aromatase inhibitors or just decides to not use them and wants to run super high levels of estrogen, then then you can't expect enclomiphene to just be able to to take care of everything. Now, if you're if you're properly balancing out your your estrogen levels and um, and you're and you're utilizing aromatase inhibitors, you have your TRT going, and you throw some enclomiphene in the mix, then it can handle it really well at low doses. Sometimes you have to go up a little bit, um, and then you can also actually because these all work in different ways, you can actually combine some of these, but it has to make sense. And this is where things get even more complicated. So at that point, I would definitely tell you, hey, it's really important to talk to your medical professional. Make sure that they understand all of this stuff. You know, if they don't, they shouldn't be giving you advice. Um, but, you know, make sure they understand all of this mechanism and then they can figure out your piece of the puzzle that needs to fit in order to, so that you can get um, the best out of all of this stuff here. So that's what's going on. Um, the uh, I didn't want to go too far in depth with it, but I think this is enough uh, that you guys can have a, a good understanding as to how these different medications work. So any of these are available in, uh, in a typical, in a good uh, and complete uh, testosterone replacement therapy kit which is what we offer at, at Vivo Health Solutions. So hit me up here on, uh, on my channel. Definitely subscribe, like, I really appreciate it. It means a lot. And check us out on our, on our, uh, on our website, vivohealthsolutions.com. You can schedule a free consultation with me. I'd be more than happy to talk to you about your body performance and all of this stuff here and, and, and geeking out with you. Thanks a lot, guys. Stay healthy.